send the light. Send the light. Good morning, happy Sabbath, church family. I'm wearing my uh, African attire this morning as a token of uh, love and appreciation for my African family. These clothes come from uh, Central Africa, Cameroon. They were gifted to me in the city of Douala. Douala is the largest city of Cameroon, the capital, the economical capital of uh, the country. And uh, that city has... Uh, Five million plus citizens. What is very interesting there is that you can still see some aspects of history that relate to the United States because there in Douala was one of the centers of uh, transatlantic slave trade. It was a place where people that were captured would be gathered together, stripped of their clothes, of their dignity, of their freedom, and sold into slavery. And at one point, they had to pass the door of no return. You probably know this month, the month of February in the United States is Black History Month. And the reason for that is that we want to remember that God has used in the history of this country people that suffered injustice, some of the worst abuses, and yet God was capable of taking things over. And uh, those people could impact positively the history of uh, this country. In traditional African culture, clothes are a sign of belonging. When you are dressed in a certain way, you belong to a certain group. And um, in that culture, if you are given, if you are gifted a set of clothes, you're practically adopted. What they are telling you is, you are now part of our family. Even if you go back to your country, even if you don't live here, you are one of us. There's also another aspect to it. In uh, traditional African culture, clothes, your attire, spoke about identity and status. Looking at somebody's clothes, you could discern what the identity, what the status of that person was. And I'm using this to bring ourselves closer to biblical culture. Because in biblical culture as well, the way somebody dressed indicated identity and status. For instance, the priest had priestly garbs. The king had kingly garments. Common people had a different kind of clothes. And looking at people, you could recognize who they were. The book of Revelation, in the first chapter, in the first introduction to a sanctuary theme of that book faces us with somebody that is dressed in a particular way. The way he's dressed is indicative of who he is. I would like us to pray and then jump into it. Heavenly Father, we praise your name. We appreciate 
your grace and truth. We are here to learn from you, and we pray that you will bless each one of us in Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. I would like to start reading from the book of Revelation, first chapter, right from the beginning. Revelation chapter 1, starting with verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place, or in quickness should take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. This is the passage we saw last week. Then it goes on, and please notice that most of the language used here is still non-symbolic, pretty plain language. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. This is God himself. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne, this is indicative of the Holy Spirit. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler, please keep this in mind, he's the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Please keep that in mind too. And has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds. And every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And after this beautiful introduction to the entire scroll, to the entire book, John goes on with verse 9, and this is how he continues. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos from the word or for the word in the Greek it is because of the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Early Christian tradition, more specifically Tertullian, says that John the Apostle, who seemed to be the youngest from among the disciples, was treated in a very rude way and among other things, they tried to fry him. Fry him, literally. He was thrown into a cauldron of boiling oil. And nothing happened to him. Now, of course, I cannot verify that. That's not in the Bible. But then he says that after that, he was remitted to his uh, exile. And that's what John says here, that he was on an island called Patmos. And it seems that the island called Patmos was actually a sort of jail or prison island where the captives 
were forced to work in the quarry. They would uh, cut stone from the quarry. We don't know whether John was still able to do that. Most likely he was pretty old at this time. But what we know is that when somebody is exiled, and somebody is taken away, cut away from his uh, beloved, that is a very difficult experience. Uh, just imagine him, this elderly guy, white hair, long beard, and he's there alone, probably, maybe even lonely. He and his thoughts, and sometimes those thoughts can be pretty dark, and uh, he, he thinks about the whole reality of what he is part of. He's one of the disciples of Jesus. Jesus left. He said he was going to come back. He did not come back. And uh, all the other disciples are already gone. What is going to happen? In such conditions, it would be no surprise if fear creeps into somebody's heart. And he goes on saying, verse 10, that one day he was in the Spirit. What day? On the Lord's day, he says. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And uh, I know there are all kind of interpretations with regard to what that means. I strongly believe this should be the Sabbath. Because I believe when somebody is in a situation like John was in, Sabbath is a blessing and also a very difficult time. Because the, the days of the week, they pass somehow. But on a Sabbath, you would do what? You would gather with your brothers and sisters. But on that day, he says, I was in the Spirit. So he's, he was probably meditating. He was speaking with the Lord. He was in the Spirit. And he says, And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. Please notice, the voice is not the voice of a trumpet. It's as loud as the voice of a trumpet. And the voice says something. I am the Alpha and the Omega. And it immediately explains what that means. The first and the last. And verse 11 continues. Verse 11. And what you see, and from this moment on, we watch the movie. Up to this point, it was only sound. The book of Revelation is actually a movie that was made first, and then the book was written after the movie. Pretty awkward, right? Usually you've got the book first, and then somebody does the movie based on it. No, no, no. God flipped it around and gave John the movie. He said, you watch the movie, and based on the movie, you write. You write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, Turkey. Relatively close to the place where the earthquake happened this last week. It's not on this side, the eastern side, it's on the western side. But it's in the south, there. To Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And please now notice the description of this magnificent being that speaks to John. Verse 12. Then I turned, he says, to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, the seven lampstands which you saw, explains this same being later, 
and verse 20, are the seven churches. So 1 John is facing this direction. Maybe he's even praying. I'm just playing this out because uh, you, you've probably seen pictures with John on his knees on Patmos. So that's a pretty remarkable picture. He hears the sound of the voice. And then he says, I turned around. And when he turns around, he sees seven lampstands. They are lined up in a certain way. And that's important because you will see that whenever those seven lampstands that are actually seven what? Churches are mentioned in the book of Revelation. They are always mentioned in the same exact order. Now, I don't know if they were laid out like this, exactly lined up. But what the text says is that the one that spoke to John, verse 13, and in the midst of the seven lampstands was who? One like the Son of Man. I wonder how did he know he was like the Son of Man? Well, when you spend some years with somebody, you kind of recognize the silhouette of that person. But it's interesting to notice that he did not say he was the Son of Man. He said he was like the Son of Man. I wonder why. It seems to me that some things would resemble the Son of Man, but some things would some, somehow contrast the mental picture, because we, every, we, all of us have a mental picture of the people we know, right? So, he's clothed with a garment down to the feet. And there's a certain word there, poderes, in the Greek, which means all the way down. And it's also used in uh, the Old Testament Greek, that is the Greek of the, uh, Greek of the Septuagint, to indicate the garments of whom, do you think? Remember, the one like the Son of Man walks among, among the candlesticks, among the lampstands. Now, that is a very common picture if you think about some people that know their Old Testament. Remember, this is written out in a code. Why a code? Because the message had to get there. If it was written in plain language, it would have been more difficult to send it out and pass censorship. But these people know their Old Testament, and they know that in the sanctuary there was a candlestick that had how many branches? Seven branches. And somebody would go in every morning and every night to tend, more specifically to trim the candles. Why did he need to go and do that? Because there were two things. First, the wick of those bowls, because each one of those uh, candlesticks had a bowl with oil in it. He had to remove the charred ends of those wicks so that now the oil will burn well. Everything that hinders, everything that frustrates the shining of the light, keep this in mind had to be removed. And then he had to fill up that little bowl. Why? Because the light in the holy place had to be a tamid, 
What does tamid mean? It had to be perpetual. And there are two explanations. Some say that only during the night was it on. I believe there's plenty of biblical evidence it was during the night and during the day because that tent didn't have windows. Okay, so when you have a, a, a hard building with thick walls where light doesn't penetrate from the outside, when you get in there, you need light. So the light was perpetual. And John sees the one like the Son of Man walking among the candlesticks as if he is tending, trimming those candles, those lamps, so they will shine. The message seems to be pretty powerful. John, don't worry. I'm here. Yes, you've got your dark thoughts. You may be thinking the light will soon go off. The light will go out. No, John. I'm here. I'm here tending. I'm here trimming the lamps. I'm here filling them up. You can rely on me. The light will never go out. The light will never die out. I am the light. You remember Jesus saying that. I am the light. But he equally said, you are the light of the world. Because no matter how dark it is, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how dire it is, no matter how depressive it is, Jesus comes, he shows up to John, and says, no, no, I am the light, and therefore you are the light, and the light will never die out. And after this beautiful introduction of who he is, which will place a mark on the entire rest of the book, he goes on, verse 14, verse 14, his head, John describes this magnificent being, his head and hair were what? You know why you cannot see it? Because I wrote it in white. <laughs> his head and hair were white like wool as, oh, you can see now, white as snow. Wait, 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 wait. I think now I get an idea of why John said someone like the Son of Man. When John saw Jesus for the last time, he probably had dark hair still. But he appears with white hair. Huh. But what is that about? Well, in the Old Testament, you can see a similarly magnificent being in the book of Daniel chapter 7 where somebody that has white hair and is called the Ancient of Days sits down to do what? Justice. And uh, in Jewish literature, in the Babylonian Talmud, there is something very interesting. They say there that when God goes to war, his hair is dark like a young man's. But when he sits in session, most people translated it like that, in session, when he sits in court or in judgment, doing justice, how's his hair? White. Why white? Because white is a symbol of wisdom. And that's why God is pictured with white hair. And sometimes it's call, he's called the ancient of days. He's been there forever. Yes, and his eyes are like flame of fire. Well, somebody that has eyes like flame of, flyer, uh, flame of fire, that person can see. That person can really see. And this echoes again and again 
when the message of the seven churches is played out. Because in the case of every single church, Jesus starts his message with these words, I know your works. Now, is that good or bad? I know your words. How do you know them? Well, because I have good eyes. I've got good eyes. I know your works. Is that bad? Is that good? Well, let's see. Verse 15. His feet were like fine breasts, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. 16. He had in his right hand seven stars. And then in verse 20, he explains what the seven stars are. The seven stars are the messengers, the angeloi of the seven churches. But something weird comes now. Out of his mouth went a two-edged sword and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength a two-edged sword is that good or bad well a two-edged sword in the old testament and you can check it out in psalm 149 for instance is a symbol of divine justice and uh, you will see that to a sword again in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19 starts with a picture in which some beings praise God for His justice. And then it goes on and verse 15 says, Now out of His mouth goes a sharp sword. Some uh, translations have two-edged sword, depending on the variant of the text, that with it he should strike the nations. Well, this again seems to be some sort of executing justice on those that persecuted God's people. Because throughout the book of Revelation, God's people are pictured as belonging to heaven, and the enemies of God's people are the nation, the nations. And Jesus Christ here is the King of kings and Lord of lords, but he has one more name. I mentioned it last time. What is the other name? Something that is connected to the two-edged sword that comes out of his mouth. His name is? The word of God. Huh. Interesting imagery. Can you see how this whole picture is packed with meaning? All kind of layers. And you just go through it and, and you, you think, oh my Lord. How many interesting things. Look in chapter 2, verse 16. Revelation 2, verse 16. You will see that again, the two-edged sword is a symbol of divine justice. And you may think, okay, so if the main point of this picture is that Christ is there tending, trimming the candles, that the light will not go out, why so much justice in this picture? White hair, to a sword. Well, there's an explanation for that. Because indeed, the garment... The description of the garment is the garment of who? Of the priest. Only that Jesus is not only priest here, but he is also what? King. He's a king priest. And among other things, it's the prerogative of kings to do what? Justice. And you've seen already in the introduction, if you kept in mind, that he is the king of all the kings of this earth. 
Jesus is king. The resurrected Jesus who's pictured here is not only priest, he's also king, and he has justice prerogatives. But there's something else too. The picture of the sanctuary. The sanctuary by and large is centered around divine justice. Because the essence of sin that God justly handles in the sanctuary is injustice. And I would like to put a text on screen there, Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 15. This is God speaking about that anointed covering cherub who was perfect in his ways from the day he was created till, and the word in most translations is iniquity or evil, unrighteousness, wickedness. The Hebrew meaning of the word is injustice. Till injustice was found in you. And throughout the sanctuary service, God has been giving to the Israelites a sandbox kind of lecture, lecture or lesson on how a just God justly handles the problem of sin, which is actually a problem of injustice. And there's one more aspect to it. The Hebrew festival that is in view here is the festival that speaks about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What festival is that? Which one is it? Passover or Pesach. Did you know that the festival of Passover or Pesach centered around the concept of justice? Just remember Exodus. The oppressors of God's people are taken out. God is doing justice. The oppressed people of God is set free. But not only them. With them, a mixed multitude of all kinds of people could leave Egypt. How was that possible? Well, the symbol speaks for himself. Because on that night, a lamb died. And John says, through his blood, through his blood, we were washed. Yes, because the lamb died, they were now set free. Please keep this in mind. You and I being set free is because of the blood of the lamb. The only reason why those people were set free, and not only the Israelites, those that were now circumcised, but also some other people, is because although God was doing justice, His justice was mixed with mercy. His justice only took out the oppressors, those that had their hearts, their hearts what? Hardened. Pharaoh hardened his heart, but then the text says that the Egyptians hardened their hearts. Can you see how the celebration of Pesach is centered on the concept of justice? Yes, the covenant of God is based on the blood of the Lamb. But once they left Egypt, do you remember what remarkable moment they had at a mountain called Sinai? And it's very interesting how the story goes. In Exodus chapter 19, God offers a covenant to them. The lamb had already been killed. He offers a covenant and they are ready to listen to the stipulations of the covenant. And God gives them first the ten words, the ten davarim, the decalogos, the decalogue. But then God also gives them 
something that is called in chapter 24, verse 7, the book of the covenant. And that book of the covenant contained what? You can read chapter 21, verse 1. The mishpatim, the judgments. These are the judgments, God tells Moses. And God spoke those words from the same Mount Sinai. Only that now he was not speaking in the hearing of the people because they got scared, they got afraid. He was speaking to Moses and Moses was going to relay them to the people. God's judgments. And that book contains all kind of case laws as to how to proceed if this or this or this or this happens in God's people. Please keep this in mind. Whenever somebody sinned, forgiveness existed with some very few exceptions that were capital punishment. Forgiveness existed where? At the sanctuary. That's where the blood was going to cover. God was taking away their sins and somebody, the lamb, Jesus Christ, was cut off so they will be forgiven. But after they were forgiven, what were they supposed to do? Could they go back and do the same things that they came here to confess and repent of? Or did they have to go and learn how to live justly? They committed injustice. They came to the just God, Jesus Christ. They said, no, I'm not going to cut you out. I'm going to cut myself out on your behalf. So you're forgiven. You can go freely. But do what now? Do not do injustice. Do not in Jesus' word later, do not sin. Oh, this is very interesting. Because the Apostle Paul summarizes this whole scenario of the Passover or Pesach, where God skips or passes over or jumps over because of the blood that is there at the entrance. He does not execute judgment on them. He takes up the judgment. Jesus Christ, says the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3, verse 26. Jesus Christ was sent by the Father to demonstrate at the present time His, that is God's, righteousness. Righteousness, the same word as justice. How? That he, that is God, might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. But the Greek says, of the one of the faith of Jesus. I told you before that faith in the Bible is not faith only as, a, as an idea. Of the one of the faithfulness of Jesus. And I believe it's right to read faithfulness here. Because faithfulness is the result of the blood of the Lamb. Based on which God sends you to learn how to live justly. I know it's very popular in uh, Christianity today, even in some Seventh-day Adventist circles, to only preach about the moment when God takes away, cuts away the sin, cutting himself out. Very popular. And that is the gospel. That is the gospel. Nevertheless, the next step is that when you walk away free, not, free of your sins, free of your guilt... You are to go and learn how to live justly. Because shining, because being light of the world, 
means to live a life that is different from the light of sin and injustice. You and I, God's people, we are called to live in this unjust or unjust world. How? Justly, through Christ's righteousness. To the righteousness that, that He gives us instantaneously when we come with our sins. He forgives us. But then He sends us to learn how to live justly. And I was, I was thinking, how, how can I convey this message? Because you have these two elements there. You have the element of light and the element of the word, the sword of the word. Word as sword. Jesus uses both concepts in the context of some justice language in which he teaches us the essence of our life. Look, for instance, in John chapter 3, verse 19. And this is the condemnation. Jesus spoke about that, yes. This is the condemnation that the light has come into the world. And men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were what? Evil. Oh, that's the problem. Jesus says, yes, I'm here. I'm here cleaning, trimming the candles, and pouring light. The problem is people don't come to light because their deeds are evil and they love darkness rather than light. Verse 20, verse 20, for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. Keep that in mind. Light does something when you come to the light. What does it do? exposes you. Is that comfortable? No, it's not. The light exposes you when you come into the light. Verse 21, but he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. I want to invite you, my brother, my sister, to stay in the light, to be exposed. I know it's critically painful sometimes to be exposed but that's how light functions and then the apostle paul explains how this works when he says in uh, first corinthians chapter 11 if we judged ourselves rightly we should not be judged meaning if we stay in the light and the light shows us who we are and we judge ourselves rightly. We will not be judged because we will change our way of action. But then there is the other component, the word. Look, for instance, how Paul speaks about what the word does. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow. And able to, say it aloud, oh, the word helps you to, to judge. I don't even know how this verse functions in all details. But one thing I get from here that the... The sword, the two-edged sword of the word helps you judge things. Judge in the sense of make separation. This is just and this is unjust. And then Jesus says about his words. John chapter 12 verse 47. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge in the sense, I do not condemn him. For I did not come to judge or condemn the world, but to save the world. And yet, he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. What will judge him? The words that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Oh, pretty tricky, you would say. And I, I, prayed, I prayed, as I said, to, to capture this somehow in a more simple or, or um, 21st century picture. 
And uh, I remember something. I remember that one of my greatest disappointments, well, actually, the greatest disappointment I caused to my dear father was that I did not become a physical doctor. That's what he wanted for me. He wanted me a physical doctor. More precisely, a surgeon, because that's the peak of it. In his mind, and truth to be told, at that time I thought the exact same thing, and to some degree even today, because I was reading some books written by an African-American famous neurosurgeon, and one of his books was uh, Gifted Hands. Gifted Hands. And I, I stayed ever since with, with something in my mind. How important is this eye-hand coordination? Jesus has good eyes. And he's got something, some bodies in his hands. Right? And thinking about this, you know... In those days, I thought about it. What, what my father was preaching to me didn't just fly above my head. But I didn't feel any giftedness or call toward that. But what I, what, I, what I got to realize is that what I'm doing here is actually surgery. And it, it kind of shocked me and terrified me that I'm, I'm doing surgery and words that I use from the pulpit are surgery. They can cut. They can cut and remove stuff. Because, see, this picture of the surgery captures two elements that we have here in this picture in the book of Revelation. One is light. The light. And uh, for surgery, you need light because light does what? Exposes. Examination, right? And then the surgeon also has what? A two-edged sword, a scalpel. So when you put, oh, I have to take this off. And uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Mausali for giving this to me. I hope you, I will not break it. Okay. You have eyes. But eyes is one thing. It's something different. Uh, the light, did the light come up? Yes. Okay. All right, now. Now you can see. See, light exposes, and then the scalpel. Don't be afraid of uh, the scalpel. It only removes what has to be removed. And uh, when it, it comes to Jesus, Jesus says, I'm going to cut myself out for you. That's what kind of a surgeon he is. But let me ask you something. Oh, pretty strong light. <laughs> if the surgeon tells you, listen, you need surgery. Without surgery, you're in danger. Is that all that the surgeon tells you? Or the surgeon will also tell you what to do and what not to do after you go through surgery. Are you getting what I'm, what I'm saying here? Of course, Jesus Christ, through his blood, forgives our sins. But are we supposed to go on and sin? Go on and sin? Or he says, okay, I'm doing this surgery for you, removing your sin, removing your guilt. Please go now and learn. Learn how to live justly. In an unjust world. You know, there are two possible attitudes. 
my grandfather on my mother's side had to go to undergo surgery and then he should have respected some very strict lifestyle rules. He did not respect them. As a result, at about the age that I have now, he was buried. My wife's grandfather on her mom's side, when he was about 50, he had to undergo surgery and then he should have respected some strict rules. He was left with one-fourth of his stomach, one-fourth. And he died more than 30 years later at 84 out of a stupid accident. Not because of that thing. Okay, this is just illustration. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not giving medical advice. That's not the point here. The point here that Jesus walking among the candlesticks, among the lamps, trimming and pouring oil, tells us, hey, my blood has brought you salvation. I'm still here. The, line has, the, the light has to shine on. Please, take the sword, the two-edged sword, seriously. Because that two-edged sword does the right thing. My word in you removes what has to be removed and heals whatever has to be healed. And Jesus concludes in chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. Verses 17, and when I saw him, says John, I fell at his feet and as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. The Greek actually says, stop being afraid. I am the first and the last, verse 18. Verse 18, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. What can you say other than amen? Stop being afraid. We live in a world where you have reasons to fear, to be afraid. You have war going on, earthquakes, fires, who knows what. Jesus says, don't be afraid. I am here. Don't be afraid of surgery. I'm doing it. Don't be afraid of me. Amen.